Okay, good evening everyone. And welcome to the uh, Center for International Governance Innovation, or as we call it, CG. And my name is Bob Fay. I'm the director of the Global Economy Program here, and I'd like to thank you for coming tonight. And I think you're gonna find it to be a very interesting and engaging uh, evening. So before we begin, I'd like to, uh, CG would like to acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. CG is situated on the Haliman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River, and you can see that up there. So tonight, <clears throat> um, we're here to, to, um, to listen to Daryl Bricker and John Ibbotson, who will discuss their new book, Empty Planet, The Shock of the Global Population Decline. So the book uh, starts off rather bleak. And in fact, it makes the point that we're all actually pretty lucky to be here, uh, given some of the uh, things that uh, the human race has confronted over the years. But now we're, you know, we're up to 7 billion people and counting, and uh, the book goes on to discuss how perhaps the, the notion that the, that the population could double is probably optimistic. Um, but the, what the book does extremely well is it goes into all the socioeconomic factors that lie behind population growth. And I'm an economist, so when I was reading this book, I thought to myself, I could have written it. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm an economist, they're discussing socioeconomic factors and how it affects population growth, and this is something I've actually done work on. But I think it's fair to say there'd be no one in the room today to listen to, to the book because it would have been boring. But, but this book isn't boring because it's actually written in an incredibly engaging style and supplemented with very, very interesting stories from a wide range of countries that are used to highlight the importance of these socioeconomic factors and how they differ across countries. So Daryl and John will discuss their book for about 40 minutes. And then uh, Besma Momani, who is a senior fellow here at CG, will come up uh, and also a professor at the Balsley School and we'll moderate the discussion between them, and then we're gonna open up a Q&A session with all of you. So Daryl Bricker is the Chief Executive Officer of Ipsos Public Affairs, which is the world's leading social and uh, economic research firm. He's also a senior fellow at CG. So Ipsos, um, you may not know, also runs a very important survey for CG, which we call the uh, Global Survey on Internet Security and Trust, and I would encourage you to go on our website and take a look at it because it's full of interesting facts. The other co-author, John Ibbotson, is a well-known uh, columnist for the Globe and Mail. He's also written several, several award-winning books, and he's also a former uh, senior fellow at CG. So before I turn over the floor to them, the other thing that was coming to my mind when I was reading this book is um, a story about when I was going to London, England a few years ago. And I don't know if it's just me, but when I go through immigration in London, I always have very, very strange things happen. And um, so I was going through, and I get up to immigration, and the, um, the person the, at the agent goes, so, uh, Mr. Fay, why are you here? And I said, well, I'm actually going to the Bank of England for meetings. And the guy goes, oh, so you're an economist. And I go, yes, I am. So he goes, well, what are you going to be doing there? And I said, well, I'm just going to go talk to people about, you know, various things. And he goes, okay, listen, obviously he didn't think that was, uh, didn't prove that I was an economist. So he goes, since you're an economist, tell me which country has better growth prospects, China or India? <laughs> and I don't know if you know, it's an early morning flight. You land at six in the morning, and I'm sitting there shaking my head, and I'm going, is this guy serious? Um, and then I realized, of course, it doesn't matter whether they're serious or not, you always answer the question. So I said, off the top of my head, China in the short run and India in the long run. And the guy said, why? And I said, demographics. Well, what the book points out is that China's population will peak at 1.4 billion around 2030, and India around 1.7 billion in 2060. So five years later, I'm right. So, um, so now I'd like to uh, invite the authors to come up to the stage and, uh, and, and talk about their, their book. Thank you.
Oh, it's a long walk over here. Good evening, everyone. How are you? It's great to be back here at, uh, at CG. I'm also a fellow uh, here at CG and quite honored to be so. Uh, but what's especially uh, good for me tonight, and uh, uh, anybody here who uh, knows me knows I'm from the KW area. I'm actually from Cambridge, Ontario. My mom and dad are here tonight. So thanks, mom and dad, for coming out. And uh, so it's a bit of a homecoming to talk about a global book. And uh, what this book is about is what John and I like to call vertical knowledge. It's that thing that everybody knows. We just all repeat it. And it may not be correct. And the vertical knowledge in this instance is that the world's population, according to the UN, is going to get to 11.2 billion people by the year 2100. Uh, I think John and I make a pretty convincing argument in the, in the book that this is never going to happen. Uh, we will probably get somewhere between 8 and 9 billion people. You might argue that that's already too many people, but it's certainly not 11 billion people. Uh, probably around mid-century, and then the human population is going to start to decline. And it's not going to stop. And the reason is because we've stopped having kids. We'll get into a couple, in a couple of minutes why that is that we've stopped having kids. But to have a replacing population, you need to have at least 2.1 children born for each woman in a country. So that means that you need a little for yourself, someone to replace you, someone to replace your partner, and a little bit extra for those who won't or can't have kids. Canada right now has a birth rate of about 1.6. China has a birth rate of 1.5 and India has a birth rate of 2.1. They're now at replacement level. By the way, 36% of the world's population lives in two countries, China and India. And if they're not having kids, there aren't any other places that are going to have enough kids to replace them. So this is going to put us in a position by the time we get to mid-century in which the population, as I said, is going to peak somewhere between 8 and 9 billion and then start to decline. And how far the decline will go Will only can depend on the number of children that we decide to have. In fact, most of the population growth that's taking place in the world today is coming as a result not of people being born and, and arriving in our population, but people living longer and not leaving. <laughs> and, the problem, and the problem, of course, when you have a lot of people hanging around for a long time uh, is that they're not in the particularly fertile production years of their lives in the sense that they're not having kids. So uh, we're reaching this point in human history in which the first time in any time that human beings have existed on the face of the earth at, at a global level, that we're actually deciding, deciding to have a smaller population. John? And we're going to talk a little bit later about the implications for this in terms of uh, the environment, in terms of national economies, in terms of geopolitics. But I think an important thing to emphasize right off the top is that at its core, population is not rising for, ter for terrific reasons. The reasons are all good reasons. There's one, one reason why uh, population f uh, birth rates are going down. Well, there are already uh, about two dozen countries where, who are losing population every year. Um, places in the world that you think are having lots of kids are not having lots of kids. For example, the birth rate for Latin America and the Caribbean, all of us, so everything except for the United States and Canada, is 2.1. That entire region is at replacement rate. Um, countries like Brazil, the fifth largest country in the world, is, is at 1.8. Um, parts of Southeast Asia are, are well below replacement rate. Um, some parts of, of, of Asia, like uh, Korea, Japan, Singapore, um, Taiwan, are down to one. They are one full baby short of what they need to do to keep their populations going. So why is this happening? Um, and why do uh, we believe the UN is wrong in its projections? The, and, the, and the single s simple word for it is urbanization. The United Nations believes that the pattern of birth rate decline going forward in this century will match the pattern of birth rate decline in, in the last you know, 75, 80 years. It was, so what happened after the Second World War up until now is going to just keep going. We think that's wrong. And the reason we think that's wrong, and, and, and we are channeling many demographers who think this is wrong, 
is that urbanization is accelerating in the developing world. We're already fully urban throughout the entire developed world, but the developing world is urbanizing at a tremendous clip. Four things happen when a country uh, becomes more urban than rural. The first thing is children stop being an asset and start being a liability. On the farm, the kid is another you know, pair of hands to work in the fields. In the city, the kid is just a mouth to feed. Um, any of you who know, live in cities know the kid is just another mouth to feed. Uh, speaking in terms of pure, pure, pure economics, they have other advantages, but just in terms of economics. A second thing happens when a society goes from being mostly rural to being mostly urban. Women acquire autonomy. This happened through the course of the, the, the developed world, and it is happening at an incredible pace in the developing world. Women in the city have access to education systems that they don't have in the village. They have access to state schools. They have access to mass media um, in the city in a way they don't in the village. They have access to other women who educate each other um, when they're in the city in a way that they don't when they're isolated in the village. Women, once they have more education, demand control over their lives and their bodies. This happens everywhere in the world without exception. There is no exception to this anywhere in the world. Once women get a certain amount of education, they begin to make demands. One of the demands that they make is they get to decide how many children they're going to have. And invariably, they decide to have fewer children than their mothers had. The third thing that happens, the power of organized religion declines. Every religion in the world, and it's really quite remarkable, there isn't one exception that I, we've ever come across, every religion in the world believes that women should be subordinate to men, and that women uh, should uh, you know, uh, have lots of children um, and stay at home and look after the family. It's remarkable how many uh, religions believe this, or would be except that all major religions are dominated by men. Um, but one, and, and in a rural environment, religion is powerful. But once you move into the city, the power of religion begins to decline. We were looking at the Philippines, where the Catholic Church is uh, alarmed at the precipitous decline in um, mass attendance. Well, the Philippines is urbanizing. And by the way, its fertility rate is crashing at, at the same time. Fourth and finally, clan uh, ceases to be important. Uh, when you're living in the village environment, that big extended family places a tremendous pressure on you to get married, to settle down, to have kids, to do all those things. When you move to the city, the power of the clan is replaced by co-workers. They're the ones you spend most of your time with. When was the last time one of your co-workers urged you to have a baby? So urbanization produces um, an economic disincentive to have children. It gives women power to make uh, decisions about their bodies. It weakens the power of religion, and it weakens the power of the clan. And all of this leads to what we are seeing and what we describe in the book, uh, which is rapidly falling fertility rates throughout those parts of the world where we would think, and the UN still thinks, you are going to continue to see high fertility rates. And so let's talk a bit about the consequences. Daryl. Well, actually, before I get on to the consequences, I just wanted to say uh, Bob mentioned that, you know, if he wrote this book, it would probably be pretty boring because it would be a lot of economic statistics and we'd be going through a lot of numbers. Uh, we do that very briefly in the book, but there's no charts or graphs in the book. We're very proud of that. Yeah, we're very proud of that. In fact, we made that decision right at the start, no charts or graphs. So what does the book focus on? Well, it focuses on these arguments, but what, what it also is, is a travelogue. So John and I traveled around the world and went to various places to see what was actually happening on the ground. So we went to Africa, I went to Kenya, went to Brazil and visited a favela, went to India and went to a slum in, uh, in urban Delhi. Uh, we went to a dinner party in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, he was we my went, nephew. Pardon me? <laughs> What'd you say, John? He was my nephew. He was his nephew. John got to go all, all the nice places. I went to the favelas and the slums and the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, um, uh, it was... Uh, it, it, what was really interesting was that everything that John just said about what goes on in these communities and what's going through the minds of people when they're making decisions about their families Regardless of the circumstances that we found ourselves in, whether it was a dinner party in, in downtown Nairobi, which I went to, or uh, in, uh, in, in Korea, in Seoul, where John was talking to university students, uh, women university students about the future of their lives, regardless of the circumstances that these folks lived in, 
the conclusions that they were coming to were the same. While there were cultural nuances that were different in different places, the conclusion that people were coming to about their future was consistent. And that was that in order to have a different life, particularly among the women, actually exclusively among the women, in order to have a life that's different from the life that my mother led and the life that my grandmother led, I need to have fewer kids. I need to be empowered, I need to be in control of what's happening in my life. I need an education, I need a career, and I need to control those decisions about what my fam the shape of my family is going to be. I recognize that I do have cultural and familial responsibilities, but I'm going to interpret them in my own terms rather than the terms, of, as John quite correctly pointed out, of some form of religious beliefs or in terms of what my clan or my family tells me I have to do. I'm going to empower myself. And so, you know, when I was in a, a, a slum in Delhi sitting with, uh, we did two focus groups in, in this slum, listening to women talk about this in very sophisticated terms, the same that I've heard in other places, and we're in like a place of abject poverty. And listening to these women talk about their lives and how they wanted things to change, and I'd see a glow under their sorry. I was thinking, what is that? <laughs> what is glowing? And then all of a sudden, one of them reached in and pulled a smartphone out. <laughs> and it was, and John and I talked about this afterwards, it was, she has the knowledge of humanity in her, her hands. The knowledge of human history, all of science, everything that you could think about. She has a data plan, as poor as she is, that she's able to access this information. And she can read it. She can also communicate with her friends and her relatives and everybody else the way that we do. But this is a person who is a fully formed, um, you know, modern person, regardless of the circumstances that they're, they're sitting in, why wouldn't she making, be making decisions that are similar to the decisions that other women are making in the world? And regardless of where we went, we kept hearing this message over and over and over again, that the story was about bringing people together in a city, urbanizing, and then the lives of women's changing, lives of women changing, and that affecting uh, what the future of humanity is going to be. And it's that simple. It's not a global decision that some, you know, government body is making or some uh, you know, higher authority. It's these little individual decisions that are being made consistently all over the world, mostly by women about the size of the families that they, they, they want to have. John? Um, so let's talk a bit um, about the consequences of this. Uh, but before we do that, I, one more anecdote. Oh, uh, away. Because we're in Waterloo. There's a fair number of people in this room involved in public policy. Um, and one of the great examples of the law of unattended consequences in public policy was um, what we found in uh, Sao Paulo. So we were really curious uh, about Brazil. It's a big country and it's poor, right? It's quite poor. The machismo culture is still very powerful. Men in, in developing countries still want sons and they want as many children as it takes to get sons and they possibly they want more than one son for insurance. So we, we heard this over and over and over again. Women saying, I want this, I've seen my mother's life, I don't want that life but the, you know, my husband, the men. Uh, this too is a universal constant from Seoul National University to the slums of Delhi. Young women don't think much of young men, but that's a different book. Um, so in Sao Paulo the question is, how could this big, poor um, country uh, with, with, with this very male-dominant culture have a fertility rate of 1.8? Well below replacement rate. How could that be? Uh, well, guess what? It's been studied. Um, and there were are, there are two things that, uh, that, that I found most amazing. Uh, one is um, soap operas. Electricity has been brought to the favelas, so there's not going to be a TV in, in you know, sort of every shack, but there's, there are TVs around, and women gather around the television sets in the afternoon, the way my grandmother used to you know, turn on uh, as the world turns you know, 50 years ago, and they watch the, the soaps, the, uh, the romances as they're called, where they see independent, powerful women uh, taking control of their lives and making very strange choices about what they're going to do with in, their, in their personal lives. Um, they, they take that as an example. And then the second one is this law of unintended con consequences. Brazil has um, universal public health care. It's really bad universal public health care. Um, 
and women uh, have children young. They have their first child around 19 or 20, so there should be lots and lots of kids. But the women don't want the kids. The husband can come home drunk, however, on a Saturday night from the bar, and nine months later, there's a kid. So what happens is, and this has been very well documented, um, the woman will say to the doctor, I want this to be my last pregnancy. And the doctor will say, well, you know, we can declare that this is an at-risk birth, an at-risk pregnancy, in which case we're going to do a cesarean section. And I want to do a cesarean section because I get paid a lot more for doing a cesarean section than just a natural birth. And if you want, while I'm there, I'll do a tubal ligation. It's called shutting down the factory. And it is the most common form of birth control now practiced in Brazil. Um, that I find just an astonishing from a public policy point of view. So let's look a little bit at, at, um, at the consequences. On the question of the environment, this is all good. Do not think for a minute that there's any sort of global, uh, global warming denialist element to this book at all. We take this very, very seriously. But we are encouraged that we might be able to reshape the models to predict a 9 billion uh, max rather than an 11 billion max, and that's going to be helpful down the road. Not now. That doesn't change the decisions we're making now. But it could be helpful down the road. Also, urbanization, um, apart from all the other things that, that a lower population would do in terms of resource depletion and, uh, and pollution of oceans and the like, urbanization uh, has the great benefit of converting marginal farmland uh, back to bush. Um, and you, we've seen this in, in developed countries. It's really only the grade A farmland now that's used. Uh, where I grew up used to be farmed, and it's now completely back to bush. So that acts as a carbon sink and also increases biodiversity. So all good news on the environmental side. Um, nothing but bad news on the economic side. Um, and the, the simple fact is this. Uh, if you have fewer young people this year than you had last year, if you have moved into a society like the two dozen already, where every year there are fewer people being born, that means there are fewer seven-year-olds than there are eight-year-olds. There are fewer 39-year-olds than there are 40-year-olds. You have fewer people available, to, A, to pay taxes uh, to support health care and pensions for all those old people, and B, you have fewer people consuming. And consumption remains, uh, you know, whether for good or for ill, the, the most important economic force driving a society. Um, it is young people leaving school, getting a job, buying the first house, buying the first car, getting the baby stroller, the smart black dress for the office party, all those things that people buy drive consumption. If you have fewer people, you have less consumption, you have less economic growth. Japan lost 450,000 people last year. Japan's in about three decades now of economic stagnation caused in large measure by population decline and an aging society. And then in terms of uh, geopolitics, it's a mixed bag, and why don't I throw the, over, the mixed bag over to you? Well, the, the good part of it is that uh, what do old people not don't do? They don't, they don't have wars. <laughs> young, wars are a young person's game. Uh, so with the aging of the world's population, the likelihood that we're going to be resorting to the old former uh, methods of conflict to solve world problems is probably going to be reduced. But the part that's probably going to be really interesting in terms of geopolitics is how incredibly wrong everybody who's analyzing China these days is getting it. I mean, I can't pick up a magazine or a book these days without reading something about the ascent of China. Maybe there's a moment where they spend time talking about the demographic challenge that's presented by China, but rarely does anybody focus on it. And the truth is with China, China's in a very difficult situation when, it's come, got its pop, when, when it comes to their population. Uh, the Economist had the best line about it, and I think we quote it in the book, where we say, uh, China is going to get old before it's rich enough to be old. So the Chinese population, the birth rate today, the UN says is about 1.5. Um, it says it's going to increase through the course of uh, the 20, uh, 21st century up to about 1.8. Uh, by the way, there's no country in the world in which that's happening, so I don't know why the UN would make that prediction. It makes no sense. Uh, so let's assume it's 1.5 as a reasonable number. A uh, big study came out in the Lancet magazine in November in which they had a whole series of, it's like five pages of mice type of the demographers that worked on, on this uh, analysis of global population trends. They have it at 1.4. Uh, and with a number like that, the expectation is that by 2030, the Chinese population is gonna start to decline. 
Remember that the average and the median age of a person in China today is 37. Back in 1950, the average Chinese person lived to the age of 40. To, by, the 20, by 2030, they're going to live to the age of 80. We've increased human life in China by, you know, almost, well, actually 100%. Um, we've increased it by that much over the space of less than a century. It's going to be a very old population, and it's going to be a shrinking population. The UN's estimates right now is there, are that it's going to shrink by 300 million people. I've seen estimates uh, in other places by very credible demographers that have it closer to about half a billion or 600 million people. By the end of the century, the possibility that the Chinese population is going to be the same size as the American population is very real. But who is going to be the emerging demographic superpower when John mentioned geopolitics and all of this? Two countries. Number one is India. India has a very young population that is going to continue to grow for the foreseeable future. But even in India, the population or fertility rate replace is, is at replacement level now. So the young population will continue to increase the, uh, the Indian population, but also increasing longevity in India will increase the Indian population. So if India hasn't already passed China in terms of population size today, it will in the next couple of years. And through the course of the 21st century, India is going to become the dominant, uh, as, uh, as Bob was talking about, Bobby, dominant population power. But as India is growing, so is America. America's birth rate is below 2. It's about 1 point, depending on the estimates you look at, 1.7 to 1.9. But the thing that America has going for it that neither India or China have going for them is immigration. So the United States takes in about a million immigrants per year. That's legal immigrants per year. Uh, the demographic suicide for the United States would be to stop that. They unfortunately have a president these days who seems to think that that's a very good idea. It is a very wrong idea. The chance for this to be America's century due strictly to demographics and an ability to maintain a youthful and growing population in comparison to major superpowers like Russia, which is in the same position as China, and India, which is going to um, obviously eclipse China but is also going to start to come back, uh, is, is very much present. So getting the immigration question right in the United States is not just a temporary political situation, it's also their future. If they can get it right, the geopolitics works very much to America's advantage. If they get it wrong, they could find themselves in the same position as the other superpowers. John? Um, by the way, this is the point at which the organizers of this event uh, uh, receive a rude shock. Um, we had promised we would speak for 40 minutes. We're not going to speak for 40 minutes. Uh, I can't even stand us for 20. I mean, it's... Uh... <laughs> and, and the... The reason is that we have done this uh, together and separately before. Invariably, we find um, that there is a long lineup of people at the microphones who really want to express their strong opinions about uh, some of the conclusions in this book and, and ask questions. So in order to maximize Q&A time, which I, is, is usually the most fun part, um, uh, I think we'll, we'll try to bring it in at half an hour, which means there are just a couple of things left to wrap up. Um, what if you, if you want to keep your population stable, right, you're not trying to become um, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, which is sort of the one place left on Earth where there are still very high fertility rates. Though those fertility rates, too, are going down. Those societies are urbanizing. Uh, one quick stat. We went to Kenya, as, as Daryl said. Um, in Kenya, they have about 10 years in now to a program that mandates um, elementary education for females. Um, so... The girls must go to grade eight. Um, and last year, it was actually the book had, had already gone to presses when the story came out. Last year was the first year in which as many girls as boys uh, sat the grade eight graduation exams. Uh, and by the way, the girls did better than the boys, though that's no surprise. Um, and guess what? The fertility rate in Kenya is coming down fast. So uh, if you want to keep a, your, your society stable, let us say, um, you don't want the economic consequences of population decline. You don't want to grow crazy either, but you'd like to get up somewhere around two. Um, there are two ways to do it. Um, Daryl has described one, uh, it, uh, which is immigration. It doesn't change your fertility rate, but people come in to replace the babies that aren't born every year. Canada, by the way, 
uh, which we think is the most successful country in the world in terms of... We're a little uh, biased. Um, in terms of immigration. We're, going, we're on our way to 50 million uh, by the middle of the century. We'll have passed Italy and Spain and be closing in on Germany uh, by the middle of the century. So immigration, if you can make it work, some countries handle it better than others, um, is a natural way to uh, replace uh, babies that are missing because of a low fertility rate. The immigrants themselves, by the way, do not have higher fertility rates. Immigrants who come to a country um, adopt the fertility rate of the country they've entered, um, not of the country that they left. So um, you can do it that way. There's a theory that you can do it through natalist policies. That is, um, you pay uh, couples to have children. You increase uh, benefits uh, for, for paternity leave. Um, you, you do all, all the sorts of things that you can in order to encourage a couple to have that third child. Um, this doesn't work. Uh, you can do it a bit. It's not that the programs themselves aren't beneficial. I'm, you know, I think you know, uh, paternity or family leave is great. We've moved in the book that it should be mandatory 50-50 men and women. Um, we, you know, if, uh, child supports are great, supports for child care are great, daycare in the office, all those things are great, so that if you want to have another child, the supports are there for you to have another child. But the state cannot compel you to have a child. They cannot bribe you to have a child. For a reason that's called the low fertility trap, which is simply that when you get into a society where one or two kids is the norm, you get into a society where one or two kids is the norm. You, it's just what everybody expects, and, and society adapts. The school system, and um, uh, you know, uh, the, the hospital, the healthcare system, everything adapts to the idea that parents will have one or two children. You don't often, just think about if one of, if one of your friends said, We've, we're getting married and we want to have five or six kids. That would be interesting, right? You would say, what, really, five or six, why is that? Well, I'm from five, um, my partner is from eight. So, um, you know, th these expectations change. The low fertility trap is also the result of why you have a child changing. You're not having a child because the state says it's your duty to have a child. The army needs, uh, you know, men to fight. You're not having a child because God says you must be fruitful and multiply. Um, you're not having a child because your family is pushing you to have a child. You're having a child because you want a child. You're having a child, and this is going to you know, raise my eyebrows, but in a sense, you're having a child as a lifestyle choice. You and your partner decide that your lives would be more rich, more rewarding, more fulfilling if the two of you um, uh, brought a child into the world and raised that child. Um, it's infinitely more important than you know, whether you go to Ecuador this year uh, or what kind of furniture you want for the living room. But it is a choice about what will fulfill you in your life. And again, most people find that they are very quickly fulfilled. Uh, one or two is usually enough. <laughs> so um, the consequences of this, I think, down the road are, are going to be fascinating. We worry a bit about um, the, the loss of creativity that having fewer young people uh, every year will have, because, you know, trust me, I know, uh, I, younger people are, are more creative than older people. Um, the, the innovation, the entrepreneurship that, that is so powerful among the young, uh, there may be less of it. Um, that said, in the great scheme of things, we're not that worried about what will happen to economies over the course of the century. Uh, I talked to an economist once, and I gave him the whole thing, the whole, this is going to be terrible, da, 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 this is awful, it's de decades of decline, and he said, probably not. <laughs> and uh, I said, why? He said, eh, these things have a way of working themselves out. <laughs> and that is a very powerful economic argument. These things have a way of working themselves out. <laughs> and anyway, there will still be uh, a tremendous amount, we suspect, of creativity, uh, of, of excitement in places like Mumbai and Lagos, um, where there will still be large young populations. Um, and we may find that these are the new centers of art and music and, and innovation and science in the mid and later decades of the century. We also think that uh, migration itself is soon, it will in the midterm be coming to an end. Uh, Canada used to bring a lot of people from China. Now not so much. China is reaching developed world status. It has uh, an aging population. There's not a tremendous, the Chinese don't feel a tremendous need to come to Canada. India is now at replacement rate. 
uh, we may find over time that um, uh, there'll be less desire uh, on the part of Indians to leave India to come to Canada. Um, Philippines, as I said, um, is urbanizing. Its fertility rate is falling. So you may, you may, we may find, you know, in a, in a couple of decades, where you have to actually have to go and beat the bushes to get people uh, to come to your country. Um, and we think uh, this geriatric peace, is, as it's called, is going to ultimately be uh, a great thing. If migrations uh, will, as, will decline, and, uh, and, and we will be a more peaceful place, whatever else we are. We wonder, though, about how it will feel. Uh, humanity has never decreased it, its population. It might have happened during the Black Death um, or during the, you know, the, the, the horrible um, wave of deaths that took place uh, when the Old World met the New World. Um, there might have been a temporary decline in the global population then. We don't, we don't, we don't know. But we have never decided to, to decline. We have never decided that we will deliberately, because of the choices we made, become a species of whom there are fewer every year. What will that feel like? What will it be like to live in a world, uh, in, and, if, and if, you know, if someone born today will reach um, their 30s in a world, we think, where the UN is reporting there were fewer people here this year than there were last year, and there will be fewer people next year, and that will never, ever stop. Um, we think, again, it will be a world at, it will be a world at peace. Uh, we hope that it will be a world that continues to be prosperous. It will be a world that is healthier uh, in terms of the air and, and the water and the land. But we also suspect that it might be a world in which a poet first notices that for the first time in the history of our race, humanity feels old. And I think we should stop it there and, uh, and get the conversation. Drop started. the mic, John. Thank you, folks. Thank you. I'm going to sit, We're gonna sit on the wings. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so thank you. That was uh, entertaining and informative. Um, and you left us on a good note, so that's good. Uh, because the word empty planet is a scary title in some way. Um, but it's something we're not used to, right? I mean, I think this is what you've painted out. It's not just the UN. Think of our pop culture. We think of zombies. We think of, you know, overpopulation. They're going to come in after us, and we're going to have to find some way to thin out the herd, right? The Avengers. Thanos was wrong. We didn't need to wipe out half the galaxy. <laughs> good to know. Um, but you guys are going against the grain here. There's a lot of people out there who are going to basically challenge your numbers and challenge your assumptions. And what I'd love to know is, what would you tell those, you know, mythical economists and demographers out there that uh, got it all wrong? I mean, why should we believe you as opposed to them? Well, I think it's, it's a pretty easy answer. Look at the data. I mean, that's what we did. We looked at the data. Um, not just us, but many, 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 many other demographers looked at the data and said, this is not settled science. That there's still a debate that we can have about the numbers. And if anybody wants to go through the modeling, I'd be happy to do it with you. I didn't bring my, uh, my abacus with me tonight, but uh, we can certainly talk about how the UN Never does dispute that. numbers with Daryl. He always wins. <laughs> yeah, except at the poker table. It's, uh, an anyway, um, John's very good at poker, actually. Uh, but uh, we have data. We've been through the numbers. We know what it looks like. But not just us. Many, many, many credible demographers have been through it and are asking the same questions. And I would suspect that sometime during the course of this year, uh, if not next, uh, the UN will be gradually starting to reduce their estimates of what the future population is going to look like. Uh, but, John, but John and I weren't content with that. We actually traveled around and looked. And uh, actually, we're, I have a report that there are the book is riddled with mistakes, um, especially in terms of uh, fertility rates. So the, we were already on the presses when Daryl alluded to it. The Lancet produced uh, a massive report with hundreds of demographers in, uh, in, in, I think, more than 150 countries around the world. Um, and it was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And in essence, what they were saying is, we, we want to look at the numbers ourselves. We don't want to just rely on the United Nations population divisions. We want to go look at the numbers ourselves. And almost everywhere, they produced numbers that were not only lower than the numbers that the UN was using, their, their numbers are lower than our numbers. So for example, the UN, I think when we went to press, the UN had India 
at one, uh, 2.4. Correct. Uh, fertility rate of 2.4. It's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation research that said, no, it's already 2.1. Have you any idea how th what that does to global population projections when India's fertility rate is adjusted from 2.4 to 2.1? The global, the UN has the global uh, fertility rate at 2.4. Right. And um, Lancet has it at 2.3. Now, sure, that's only a tenth of a baby, but that's the entire population of the Earth. So, you know, I have, and I'll admit, when the Lancet article came out, I was reading frantically <laughs> at, at the beginning, and I just kept going, no, our number is higher than theirs, our number is higher than theirs. If we actually went in to do a second edition, we would be adjusting all of our numbers down uh, rather than up. So yeah, th there's already lots of rumors if you live in the very small and confined world of statistical demography, or population demography. It's my world. Um, <laughs> that the UN, is, the UN updates its numbers every two years. I believe the, there's a, going to be a 19 update. Uh, and that this will be the first one in which the UN begins to, uh, to reduce its expectations. They're not going to go from 11.2 billion to 9 billion overnight, but they're going to start saying our median uh, variant is, is, going to be, is, is, is now adjusted downwards. And I suspect, um, I won't be around to see it, but somewhere around 2050 we'll all meet. At, uh, and, and we'll, we'll yeah, so, so the UN, the way they do this, their 11.2 billion model is based on the idea that gradually we're going to get to a replacement rate in terms of population. But they say if we're half a child higher than that, half a child, like 0.5 of a child, uh, no like half children that. are born, but yeah. half a kid, um, higher than that, the global population will be almost 16 billion people. If we're half a child lower than that, it will be about what it is today by the end of the century. Okay, so just going based on what the Lancet did, and just not looking at the global average, but looking at the biggest countries, that's where they see the biggest discrepancies. So we're already based on that 11.2 billion variant, their median variant for the UN. What the Lancet has would already move that down. And that's based on today's data, not based on all the cultural factors that John and I found when we were doing research for this book and all the other things that we were told by other demographers as we, as we traveled around the world and we interviewed them. So I'm quite confident that we're on track to where we're, uh, uh, what we're suggesting in the book. And by the way, it's not that the UN completely disagrees with what we have. They just have the, the peak getting a little higher, a little later, and declining less. They also see in the future that the population is going to decline. So as an academic, I have to ask this. Is this a part of the story of the fact that you have people sort of in HQ, the UN, doing these tabulations, but just aren't going to the ground and talking to people. That's, what, you, the, that's what the Lancet said. Right, I mean, you're mentioning yeah. the, the Melinda and Bill Gates Fund, which of course spends a lot of effort and money to actually have that local knowledge. It actually goes into the field and supports the kind of research to find these kinds of things. And this is really a, a sad, I think, state of where, you know, we cannot uh, predict the world from our offices. As, as academics, good academics, journalists, we need to go to the field and talk to people because it's a totally different story when you get into their homes and into their into their favelas as you pointed out and uh, and we by the way we interviewed uh, John Wilmot who's the director of the UNPD I mean his position is fully represented in the book so if y you can read his take on it and decide that we're wrong and he's right um, but um, uh, but and 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 there are all sorts of people who have different explain different motives for why the UN is doing this um, we like to stay in our lane um, one of the questions we keep getting asked is, uh, isn't seven billion already way too much? Um, the, you know, are we not already doing tremendous damage to the planet? Are we already not at risk of huge um, uh, uh, you know, damage, economic, environmental damage due to climate change? Uh, but that's not something we dispute for a moment. We're only trying to get out this one idea, uh, which we think is a very big one. You think you're going to go from seven to 11, you're not, you're going to go from seven to at most nine. You think the population is going to grow for the whole century. No, it's not. It's going to peak around mid-century and then start to go down. Just offering a con uh, what we hope is a convincing argument for those two ideas is the whole purpose of the book. Uh, we hope there'll be many other books that then spin out the various implications for this. Um, uh, but we, we, as Daryl likes to put it, we like to stay in our lane. We just wanted to argue this one thing on the ground in the, in the places where it's happening. So I want to tease that out because the reason why you want to stay in your lane is that it's very political, right? To suggest that the population is not going to be as high as it is because 
part of the challenge, of course, is that we have a lot of, we do have climate change deniers. We do have people who say that this is not happening. And in fact, uh, a lot of the, um, you know, pro-environmentalist and the environmental lobby is very much worried about the state of the world if we get to these enormous numbers. I mean, the carrying capacity, back to a sort of a Malthusian type of argument, is one that suggests that it's going to be a very scary world if we're one where we're all fighting for natural resources, for food, for the rest of it. It's that kind of doomsday scenario that many people are afraid of. And of course, uh, you were at the outset being very clear that you're not trying to support uh, 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 climate change denier, because I think that's a really yeah. important subtext to this all. Okay, so, so what our point of view on this is, yes, you can have all of these discussions, but on climate change, if your principal argument is that it is created by the activities of human beings, which we both believe, mm -hmm. um, and I think the science is settled on that, if you change the denominator in the equation, the number of human beings, what does that have on your estimates? Now, I think that anybody who's a reasonable scientist can have that conversation, leaving aside all the politics. So how do you adjust your estimates based on adjusting the denominator in the equation? It's simple division, we all learned how to do it when we were in school. That's all we've done. The fact that what's happening in the environment is happening, we're not questioning whatsoever. And if people believe that simply questioning that one point is giving solace to people who are climate change deniers, you can come to John and I and we will absolutely tell you that is not what we're saying. What we're saying is get the right facts, make, come to the right conclusions, and let's have a reasonable, rational argument about this. It, the implications are ultimately political, I agree with that, but um, you know, you're entitled to your opinions and your political beliefs, but you're not entitled to your own facts. I mean, the I, we all know the IPCC numbers uh, about wh where we have to be at 2030 um, and where we have to be at, 20, at 2050. Um, s especially on the 2030 number, our arguments have no impact on that at no. all, right? What, what's happening between now and 2030, everyone ag agrees to. We're talking about what the world will be looking like 20 years after that, and it'll be a different world. But this is not an excuse at all for um, s stepping back in, uh, in efforts to, to mitigate global warming and, and, and to combat climate change. Well, and also I think another, perhaps maybe not just political message, but policy message that comes out of your book is that immigration is good. Immigration is necessary, particularly for some Western countries. Um, indeed, as you said, there may be, in fact, one day we get to a point where there's a fight for, for immigrants to come. So what do you say to the, to the naysayers out there? Because there's a lot of naysayers. Uh, you alluded to Donald Trump in, in the White House, and uh, certainly there's a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric coming out of the White House at the moment. Um, the picture that you painted of uh, this this um, declining population is very uh, reminiscent, uh, reminds me of sort of Germany today. And of course, Angela Merkel uh, a few years ago took a big gamble and, and you know, allowed more than a million refugees to come into the country. And today there is the uh, alternative for Deutschland inside the parliament. So, you know, there are a lot of naysayers. So there is a rise of global populism today. So how does, how does I mean, how do you square that, or, or if I may, what's the, you know, what, what do you say to the naysayers out there that say, you know what, immigration's not working? Well, I think the most important point, and, and again, it's no coincidence, as we say, the two Canadians wrote this book, Canada gets immigration right, or uh, Canada gets immigration better than, than any other country. For one reason, and we don't need to get into the history of it, multiculturalism works more easily for us than it does for some other countries. China just does not want immigrants. Uh, Hungary just does not want immigrants. And that's um, a cultural decision that the Chinese have made, the Hungarians have made, um, and they will live with the consequences of that. But we are a nation that has always accepted immigrants. And indeed, we are a nation that has always gone out and sought out immigrants. You know, Clifford Sifton, um, who we mentioned in the book, um, you know, in the 1890s, uh, population decline was a big issue in Canada. People were leaving Canada and moving to the United States. And it was Sifton who said, we're going to go into Eastern Europe and we are going to recruit immigrants to come to Canada. Um, and we are going to convince them to do this. And uh, you know, a lot of people said, no, 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 they'll never integrate. They're Eastern Europeans. They don't speak our language. Uh, they're all Catholics. We don't want these people. But Canada needed them. And we filled the prairies with immigrants from, uh, from Eastern Europe. As one of my students said, I, I taught a course on this at, at Ottawa. He said, no Clifford Sifton, no Wayne Gretzky. <laughs> and, and so 
that's, that's our ethos. Mm -hmm. And the important thing is always to remember that ethos. Countries that uh, bring in large numbers of people for purely humanitarian reasons get into trouble because after a certain point, you start to get that kickback, right? You bring in a million, now I'm not in, in any way criticizing Angela Merkel for bringing in uh, a million refugees. That was a terrible global crisis. Canada did its part too. Um, but you bring in too many refugees, you get alternative for Germany. The always the point is to push home the idea that we are bringing in immigrants because they have the education and the skills and the youth to power our economy. It's not some global concept. Look at your workplace. Look at your street. Look at your community. What impact uh, are immigrants having on it? Well, they are, they are owning the businesses. They are, they are diversifying the workplaces. They are producing new ideas. They are growing our economy. And if you keep immigration always focused on that, yes, we bring in about 10% of our intake every year is humanitarian, and that's important. But if you always, always focus on the fact that this is our own naked self-interest to bring these people in, um, then you will have a greater consensus in support of immigration than if you just appeal to the better, better angels of people's nature. So I, I would just add, I mean, this is one of the issues that the government's having right now. So when we go out and do our polling, yes, I'm in the polling business, uh, and we ask people what are the most important issues facing the country today, number four on the list of you know, 30 things that we look at is immigration, and that's not, not because people are happy with what's going on. And the problem that we have with immigration right now is a lot of people's perceptions are being driven by what's happening at the Quebec border. Now, the government can say what it likes about being uh, our need to be compassionate, but people do not feel that this is working. The pictures are horrible. It doesn't look like a system that's under control. And when you get the provincial government here in Ontario and you get the city government saying that many, many of the places for homeless people in shelters are being taken up by people who are refugees, alleged refugees coming over the, uh, the, the border, uh, and that you know, we have no way of controlling this, that's a big problem for our immigration uh, uh, system because people have to have the view that it is well controlled, that we're being selective about who's coming into the country, and there are people who are actually going to make a positive contribution. That's not to say that the people coming over from Quebec or over the Quebec border right now will not make a positive contribution, but that's not the type of immigration that Canadians have basically been raised to support. So this is when it becomes a problem. And when then the government turns it into an issue of your compassion, or whether your, you know, one political movement is racist or whatever, that's when we get into some very dangerous political territory in this country. As long as we stay going down the lane that John was talking about before, previously, that's when we're successful. When we go down that other lane, that starts looking like Italy, Spain, France, the UK. You want to know why we had Brexit? Brexit was driven basically by people's attitudes towards immigration and cultural change. Absolutely. You can argue the economics all you want, but I was there, I was doing the polling, I can tell you what it is. And it would be the same if we held the referendum again. Thank you. So one other big theme that you know, comes out of your book. Um, so for me, the environmental message was, was there, was very strong. Um, uh, clearly the, the, the challenge that um, this would face uh, on our policy on immigration is, is obvious. But one thing that I'd, I'd love for you to tease out for me as well is why is it so bad if we consume less? I mean, could we think about this, you know, economic, you know, we talk about this empty planet, and you certainly provide a, not quite a doomsday, but sort of the, the negative effects of this on our economy. But tell us why is that bad? I mean, what's so bad about having less black dresses being bought to that cocktail party that you yeah. mentioned there, John? I mean, you know, could the planet not afford to have us buying less anyways? Could we think about maybe this is time for us to re rethink of the way that an economy, a healthy economy, is actually even measured and thought of? You see this lane? <laughs> you see us staying right in this lane? I mean, these are impor important questions. Is liberal democracy inextricably tied to capitalism? Um, must capitalism uh, be inextricably tied to constant growth? Are there alternative economic models? Uh, what would those economic models look like? Those are fascinating questions. I can't wait to read the books by those who choose to write those books. <laughs> we are not questioning um, the, the, you know, uh, whether we need to go to a neo-Marxist or, or uh, economic model. 
um, we don't have opinions about that. All we say is... Well, we do, but we're we, not... We're not... Yeah. <laughs> we talk about it all the time. Yeah, there was but um, <laughs> not in the book. Um, it, all we're saying is, in the current globalized economic system, which is capitalist, and which is based on consumption-based growth, the economic consequences of having fewer young people are as follows. That's all we want to do. And uh, the other argument, uh, the, the, you know, whether they're alternatives, um, I, that's, that's, uh, that's for another book. But I, I did have a specific point I wanted to make on this question. And it's something that I deal with in my day job, which is uh, people who are marketers who are obsessed with youth. This idea that all of consumption, uh, all of all, all taste, Everything that has to be made is made for young people. Uh, that's because we never really actually think of older people as a consumer market. Uh, and I think that one of the things that will come out of this process of adjusting to a newer population is we're going to have to start thinking about what a consumer market looks like. So one of my favorite things, uh, uh, one of my favorite groups that I present in front of um, and have talked about these data with are restaurateurs, re restaurant association here in Canada. And I, you know, there's endless numbers of consultants and restaurant experts that get up and talk about what you have to do in your restaurant to attract young people. Well, let me help you out with something. There's not as many as you think there are. Um, secondly, they have no money. <laughs> Why do they have no money? Because all of the older people who are here in this audience still live in Waterloo, didn't sell your house, and aren't moving. <laughs> and same thing in Toronto, same thing in Vancouver. Same thing in any place that has a desirable real estate market. People are li living to an older age now. They're living well. They're living in a wealthy way. They actually are sitting on the wealth of the country, the older population. It's not the younger population. So to restaurateurs, you know what I say to them? Turn down the music so somebody can have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Turn up the lights so I can see my menu. <laughs> Maybe make the font a little bit bigger. Yes, definitely. So I can read what's on it. Um, make it possible for me to put my walker, my scooter, my whatever device <laughs> somewhere. Open up those banquettes and chairs so they're not so slippery and they're easier to get in and out of. And put some things on the menu that I actually might like to eat and maybe I'll come to your restaurant. Yeah. Daryl was like that when he was 32. But <laughs> <laughs> my mom and dad will tell you that I was like that when I was 20. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but you pointed out something very interesting, of course. Of even course I did, Beth. No, no, we, we know each other too well. <laughs> but Daryl, so, I mean, Japan. Japan is the quintessential older population at the moment. And so let me ask you, what is the downside? I mean, there is some socio, not socio-cultural challenges here now. I mean, I, I was once, to talk about demography, I think the most interesting statistic I once read was that, you know, most Italians will not know the concept of a cousin soon. And, you know, for us are, are this quintessential, you know, Italian families about, you know, uncles and aunts and tons of cousins, this big, long table. Our tables are shrinking, right? I mean, when you think about the family unit, it's becoming smaller and smaller. I think I'll write a book about it. Um, it's this one, by the way. It is this one. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not up there. That's my face. That's John's face, too. <laughs> uh, go but ahead, sorry. So, so Japan, right? Japan is a great example of where we are also now in another crisis, which is also a lot of elderly people who don't have people to care for them. I mean, this is, this is the, you know, obviously once the, 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 we decrease in our population, we have less and less dependents who take care of us in our old age. And this is becoming a challenge, of course, for elder care as well. So this is something else that we have to think about is how are we going to, you know, design our society, design our place. I mean, you know, you mentioned the restaurant. I don't think that, that's not, that's a true thing. I mean, this is the reality yeah. of where we're going. We have to start thinking about that. So what, I what is this, what would you say to policymakers yeah. and, you know, everything from urban planners to, to, to p politicians about what they need to do to prepare for that? Because that is coming. I think the number one issue that we're going to be facing in this country going forward when it comes to urban planning, any sort of design issues is mobility. And the reason is because Older people are populating our cities and our suburbs. They're not moving. And they're less likely to drive cars. And we're not building transit to accommodate them. We're not building infrastructure to accommodate them. Instead, what we're doing is building bike lanes for nobody to use. Oh, dear. <laughs> no, this is... Well, let me just give you a couple of statistics so you understand. The median age of a Canadian today is 41 years of age. 
80% of the Canadian population growth in the last 20 years has been in a car commuting community. That's the truth. So what are we doing for people who live in uh, Agent Court? What are we doing for people who live in Kitchener-Waterloo who have to get into Toronto? What are we doing for anybody who has to drive into the city of Toronto because we've built no infrastructure for them? I have nothing against bike lanes, they're fine. But that's not, that's not a mobility plan. We need a mobility plan in this province, in the city of Toronto, in this country, and every major city in the world is going to be dealing with it. And simply painting lines on a road for people who are going to ride bicycles in a country in which six months of the year you can't do it anyway doesn't sound to me like an adequate transportation policy. So, you know, don't worry about the issue of bicycles. Start worrying about the issue of how you get people from Newmarket into Toronto every day. Because that's the problem that we're really facing in this country. That's the mobility problem. And when you start thinking about bike lanes, maybe we should have them available for people who take scooters. How are people going to get around to their doctor's appointments? How are they going to get around to various... They're not taking bicycles. Why are you making it harder for them to park? They don't have a lot of choices. We're not building transit for these people. That's the new population. That's the population of our country. It's older. The average Canadian is 41 years of age now, as I said. So, so let's, get, let's get real. There's not a lot of this in the book, actually. Um, <laughs> It, but there should have been. I had a whole <laughs> chapter. <I, laughs> unfortunately, my next book. Actually, I talk about. Unfortunately, the co-author's partner owns Tall Tree Cycles. Yeah, he's a bicycle shop, um, and and wants to stay married. So, uh, but I think, uh, you know, I do agree with the economist who said these things have a way of wor working themselves out. I mean, Uber and Lyft mm -hmm. uh, are taking up part of that challenge. Yeah, but they're still cars. Um, and uh, car and ride sharing once we move to fully autonomous cars uh, may, may take care of it. The, these things you know, do figure themselves out. I think one thing that is permanent, though, um, and that will not change, is um, the, uh, the emptying out of rural environments. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't go uh, a month now without uh, a story about a village for sale somewhere uh, in Europe. Uh, by the way, you Spain, been, the latest. Yeah, there's one, there was a for 40. 45,000 bucks gets you six houses, uh, the entire village, um, in a depopulated part of Spain. Uh, there's also a, um, a village in Sicily for sale. So, and we're seeing this in Canada too, obviously. Urbanization only goes in one direction. Um, and there's no way to stop that because I think at a fundamental level, people want to live in places where services are available, where jobs are available. Um, you can boutique it, right? You can make uh, your small town desirable because I'm from Gravenhurst. It's on a lake, so we're going to be fine. The lake is going to take care of Gravenhurst. Um, um, other places set themselves as retirement communities, and, and, and that makes some sense as too. There are um, communities that uh, are attractive to entrepreneurs who don't want to live in a city, uh, but who are artists who would rather live in a rural environment. But uh, in the long run, this only goes in one direction. These mega cities are going to get mega -er, and these suburbs are going to get even bigger because the number of people who uh, are coming to us from parts of the world where they lived in cities and want to live in cities, and the numbers of us who are living in rural environments, although there are precious few of those left, uh, but can't find jobs in those rural environments and move to the cities, um, will, will continue. So in, in Japan, they are putting mannequins up in some villages, just to create the illusion that people are actually sitting on those tables. And yeah, it's not cafes. a joke. It's, it's, it's actually, it's actually it's true. Right. So what does this mean for our food supply? I mean, is this also going to be, you mentioned earlier that some arable land is now switching back to bush. Um, yes, that's good for the overall, obviously, um, situation with our climate, but it also has negative effect on the food supply, does it not? No, well, what's happened in the agriculture industry, you can just look at Canada as an example, we're much, much more efficient at producing food today than we've ever been. Every year we get more efficient at doing it. Uh, most of the farming, the thing that's really changed in farming is a switch from basically farming businesses 
away from family farms. And right. you can say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but farming businesses are more efficient for producing food than family farms. And uh, that balance keeps getting greater and greater, the difference keeps getting greater and greater every year. So actually what's happening is uh, the land that we actually are required, we require to produce uh, the food products that our population is going to need is actually getting smaller, even if our population is growing a bit. Um, and this is true globally. Uh, again, we don't want to get into a debate about you know, genetically modified foods or corporatization of the agriculture sector. Stay in the or lane. Or stay in the lane, stay in the lane. Oh, but I want but, to. Let's go. Um, <laughs> but uh, one thing we point out is, because I mean, we, we, there's a whole chapter on the neo-Malthusians, right? So all the way back to Thomas Malthus, who said that you know, there would have to be endless oscillations of the population with population crashes and poverty and, and, and death and starvation. And we, we remember Paul Ehrlich in the 1960s with his population bomb. Uh, by the 1980s, we would be in a post-industrial wasteland. The Club of Rome in the right. 1970s. Um, there are books out right now that talk about massive population growth and the, you know, the terrible impact that they're going to have. And again, it, you know, we, we, we don't, all we want to say is in terms of our ability to feed ourselves mm -hmm. and sustain a higher population, that's not an issue. Right, we sustained a one billion, we sustained two billion, we are sustaining seven billion. There are environmental consequences to that, absolutely. But there has not been a famine anywhere in the world since the 1990s that was not induced by its own government um, or by other governments uh, w waging war. All famine is the result of geopolitical action now, not the result of desertification or drought or anything else. We can feed 7.2 billion fine. I suspect if we are completely wrong and we get to 11 billion, just in terms of agricultural capacity, we'll be fine at 11 billion too. We have always found ways to improve agricultural productivity much quicker than uh, population growth. Not, in a, not talking about the environmental consequences right. of that, just our agricultural capacity. Although the caveat there is that that assumes that we're gonna stick to more of a plant-based diet. Certainly if we all move towards meat-eating diet, as many are saying now increasingly is happening, in particular in China, as middle class goes up, then we're in a problem because of course the amount of arable land that an animal takes is far more than uh, a plant-based diet. Unless we're make. making meat in a lab. <laughs> <laughs> That's Which what we're now starting to do. Yes. Have you had a Beyond Burger? Have you? I've my been my told. partner's my partner's a vegetarian. I heard it's great. It's great. It's fantastic. I heard it's great. This First time he tasted beef in 30 years. That's right. That's right. Okay. Final theme, gender, because you have a really interesting theme. Two in this middle aged book. guys are going to ask yeah. us. We're going to. Well, I, I I coined you as feminist. I have to point at liberal feminists in this book. You know, very traditional Western liberal feminists, because there is a lot of gender conversation in this book, and I think it's really interesting. Um, and again, as I we talked uh, sort of offline earlier, um, you know, I see a lot of the, the you know the challenges that many of the women that you had a chance to meet with talk about, which is you know it's increasingly more difficult to have children, uh, to have lots of them. They you want to give them a better quality of life. Certainly, urbanization doesn't make it easy. There is a great theme in your book about female empowerment that I must say really you know, spoke to my heart. And I'd love for you to just comment a little bit about some of these vignettes and stories of the great women that you met across the world, because there's many of them in this book, but if I could give you an opportunity to just give us a few that stand out that really well kind of made you think, aha, that's, that's really... Well, uh, we talked about India and we talked about Brazil. Uh, the other one I think that uh, when we were writing it at the time, both of us, it really gave us a, a, a bit of a, a start, uh, was Kenya. And uh, Kenya is still a very traditional country when it comes to the issue of courtship. So uh, the way th things happen in Kenya is you really don't go out and find your love match. It's still very much arranged marriages. Dowries are paid by the, the husband's family to the wife's family. Uh, but when you get into the culture of how dowries work and how mating works in, in Kenya, you soon discover that even in the most traditional cultures, the effect is to push marriage later in a person's life and to pr push child production later into a person's life. And the reason is because the state in Kenya is basically seen as uh, a place where corruption takes place. It's not a place where you go, like in our country, if you needed to get welfare support or healthcare support or education support. It's, it's, a, it's a place where corruption takes place. So your social safety net, your, the thing that you rely on to make your life possible is family. 
uh, families, clans, tribes. They, they divide it up in those kinds of ways. And what really uh, uh, is the essential mission of every young person in, the, in that type of a family environment is to strengthen that social safety net on behalf of the family, which means that if you're a woman, getting paid uh, uh, considerable, as much money as you can get or whatever the, the payment is, is usually, by the way, in livestock, for your marriage to somebody and for a man, being able to demonstrate that you can support somebody at the level that they uh, deserve to be supported at and add to the family network. Well, for an urbanizing country that's increasingly moving towards capitalism and Western business, that means moving from the countryside, moving to the city, getting an education, getting a job, demonstrating that you can put together the wealth to pay for a dowry, which means now you're now moving into your late 20s and your early 30s. And for women, because you want to make a contribution beyond uh, just having children, but you want to make a contribution to the social safety net, you uh, have to get an education and, and uh, get married at a later age. So when we'd interview women in Kenya, they would be talking to us in very similar ways to somebody if I had interviewed them in Canada, except they um, feel this tremendous obligation to support their family and to make sure they're worth whatever it is that they need to either pay or be paid uh, as a result of this whole cultural practice of people getting together. And that was fascinating to me. I, I'd never encountered that. The interesting thing was when we went to India, it was the exact opposite. So the bride price or the dowry was paid actually from the bride's family to the, the husband's family. But a very similar kind of process went on because you couldn't rely on the state infrastructure. You had to, had to strengthen your family. And what, what I wasn't prepared for, and I don't think John was either, was how that had the same effect as getting uh, and pushing terms of pushing back marriage and having kids in a person's life the same way that it was doing it in, in a Western cult country like Canada. Uh, I would add two, uh, <coughs> two very quick points and then let, we can open it up. Um, <coughs> the first was, what an optimistic story this is. It is fundamentally an optimistic story. Um, a woman in the United States in 1800 would have on average seven children. A woman in the United States in 1900 would have on average four. So the fertility rate um, <laughs> almost halved in the 1800s. That's when women began to have property rights. Women first began to get an education. Um, the fertility uh, rate in the United States in the 1950s was uh, just over three during the baby boom. By the 1970s, it was down to two. This was where the sort of the first wave of, of emancipation, the, the arrival of the, of the, of the pill, of uh, the increased participation by women in the workforce. By the 1990s, it had dropped below um, the replacement rate in, in the United States and, 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 and most of the rest of the world. So this was a 170 year, prior, not, almost two centuries of steady but slow progress in which women went from having no rights of any kind whatsoever to having something, formerly at least, something approaching full equality. The developing world is doing it in a single generation. They are moving with incredible speed, and that can only mean that um, the, the rights of women in those developing countries are also going to uh, increase at a much faster rate than they increased in the past. Um, again, you know, as many Kenyan girls are getting uh, grade eight as Kenyan boys. The other thing that we noticed, and this is purely anecdotal, so I, you know, I, I, we, I wouldn't stress it, but if you talk to um, university students in Seoul, and only women university students in Seoul, how many kids do you want to have? One or none? I'm not getting married. Um, well, why not? Because, um, and there's data to prove this, uh, Kenyan men do less housework, or uh, Korean men do less housework than any other men anywhere in the world, with the possible exception of Japanese men, at least in the developed world, yeah. um, than Japanese men. And I said, but you know, come on, you're, you're graduate students at Seoul National University. The guys that you meet are going to be much more enlightened. Uh, they're going to be much more um, you know, millennial uh, guys. And then they said, well, not so much. They claim they are, uh, but not so much. And anyway, you don't just marry a guy in Korea, you marry the guy's mother. And, uh, you know, the mother-in-laws uh, would, would freak out if we asked our husbands to, you know, change the diapers and take time off work. So they were saying, um, rather than go through all of that, they'd rather just not get married. Get or, get, or get married very late and have, you know, just one child. And how close was that to the women in the, the slum in New Delhi? 
Our husbands are useless. They, come, they, they only work when they want to. They spend all the money on drink uh, and gambling. And then they come home and they want sex. Um, this is not the life we want. Uh, well, the life we want is one where there are, you know, at most two children uh, to look after us when we get old. Um, and, and we have freedom and opportunity to live uh, our own lives rather than just be, you know, caregivers. I need uh, my own money so I can have some rights. And I thought, you know what? It doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you get women away from men and get them talking off the record, <laughs> they all say the same thing. I, we didn't do it in Canada, so I couldn't possibly say. <coughs> Sounds like you guys did some counseling at the same time as writing a book. Okay, we're going to open it up for questions, but one last just final thought. Are we going to be a lonely place, though? I mean, as our popula population is shrinking and that you know, metaphoric table is shrinking and we have less and less people on it, are we getting ready for literally not quite an empty planet, but at least an empty solitude life? Well, John and I are talking about our next project and that's one of the things that we want to take a look at. Um, so what are the implications of some of the things that we're talking about in Empty Planet. And not so much just about economics or whatever. I mean, anybody can do that. What we're really interested in is how people are yeah. going, what culture is going to be like, right. how people are going to live together, how families are going to operate. What's, uh, what, what's, what's you know, love, romance going to look like in a world like that? Uh, now, we're not going to be so lonely in the sense that we're all going to be living in cities, but the fastest growing household type in the world today mm -hmm. is people living on their own. Yeah. At the beginning of life and at the end of life. So it's going to be a very, very different society based on the kinds of people that are going to exist on the face of the earth in the way that they are choosing to live together. Uh, you can have a really dystopic view of that. In mm -hmm. fact, we, there's a tremendous amount of information out there that's pretty dystopic about that. Uh, I think John and I, our view is, you know what, there's some green, green shoots of opportunity out there. Uh, that we see what the you know, potential positive way forward is going to be. And, uh, and we talk about it a bit in this book, but uh, uh, I d do not see it as doom and gloom. I actually see it as just a humanity in transition, and there will be, as John said uh, previously, we will find a way. Okay. So let's open up for questions. They can there's come on down. There's, there's a couple of mics here. Yeah, yep. uh, yeah, leave mics there's on either side. There's some microphones. Or just stand up and yell it, because this is they have really good acoustics here. Oh, it's always yes, sir. Uh, yeah, the blue shirt. Yeah. Go ahead. Go. Yes, is a, is a quick and easy way to answer that. Um, there are, there are uh, Muslim countries that have um, high fertility rates, but they tend to be impoverished and strife-torn. So uh, Iran, for example, is at 1.7. Iran is well below replacement rate. Uh, Tunisia is at replacement rate. Egypt uh, is coming down. Uh, Malaysia is at replacement rate. Indonesia is above replacement rate, but not much. I think it's, it's about 2.3 or 2.4. So you see fertility rates coming down in Muslim countries where um, there is a developing economy, a growing middle class, increased opportunity for women to have education. Where you have still the really dysfunctional uh, numbers are where you have really dysfunctional countries, Iraq, Syria, uh, Tunis um, Libya, places like that. Uh, but 
there's, uh, there is no real difference between, let's say, Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, both are archipelagic countries um, w that are de with developing economies, high level of poverty, but increasing urbanization, and as a result, quickly declining uh, fertility rates. And there is no evidence that I have ever seen that um, Muslim fertility rates are any higher in Western countries, in fact, I know they are, uh, than they are in uh, than any other group. In other words, it doesn't matter where you come from. When you come to Canada or Belgium or Sweden, you will adopt the fertility rate of that country, at least within one generation, um, do that. In fact, there's even strange and bizarre evidence that, and this was done in Belgium. Uh, so there's a large Moroccan population in Belgium. The Moroccan uh, birth rate in Belgium is the same, the, you know, the Moroccan Belgium birth rate in Belgium is the same as the European origin Belgium yeah, birth rate. But it also appears to be going down in Morocco. And there's some anecdotal evidence that Moroccans living in Mo Morocco, seeing that their cousins are living good lives in Belgium with, you know, uh, with 1.5, um, are having fewer kids back in Morocco. That, I, that, that is more anecdotal than real. But in terms of hard evidence, no. Uh, uh, as long as the country is reasonably stable and educates its women, um, that country's birth rate goes down. It doesn't matter what the cultural religion is. Yep. Thank you very much for your presentation. Excellent presentation. I had a couple of points I just wanted to ask you about. Number one, it was comforting to hear you mention that as the population gets older that uh, wars may possibly decline. I think I understood you correctly when you said that. But what I'm wondering is who decides who starts wars? Does that have anything to do with the age of the people in a country? Or is it controlled much more by leaders who, uh, for various reasons, put in place and make their own decisions? And secondly, even if uh, people lose their ability to fight wars physically, we've moved toward, or moving toward, unfortunately, a kind of, of fighting of wars, which is going to be carried on through drones, already is for that matter, but where artificial intelligence uh, will play a much bigger role. So I'm just wondering, quite honestly, whether you're simply perhaps a little too optimistic about that scenario. Uh, my, quest my second question was concerning um, migration, and I think you mentioned too that we would perhaps see a tapering off or an ending of migration, but I wonder if you'd comment a little bit on climate-driven migration uh, with the warming of the world's climate and what effects that's going to have. And the third point, I think Best Mamani mentioned it, uh, uh, food, uh, I believe I've read recently that we waste about 40% of the food that we produce in Canada, for example. So indeed, we seem to have a great opportunity by better use of our food resources to deal indeed with a much bigger population or a population even if population declines. I mean, we have ways of offsetting that. Thank you. Okay, so I'll deal with the first two and if you want to deal with the third one or I can deal with all three. You deal with all three. Okay, so on the first one, <laughs> first Let one. Let me bring up my platform. Go ahead. First one, uh, geriatric piece. <laughs> um, the, uh, <laughs> John's going to tweet, I guess. Um, geriatric piece, I mean, that's not even our idea. I mean, that's something that a lot of people have been talking about. There's a really good book that just came out by Paul Moreland, who actually reviewed our book uh, in the Globe and Mail on uh, the impact of demographics on politics. And this is one of his big arguments, which is um, that uh, uh, if you go and you look at the median age of places that have conflicts, they always have younger ages. So as older ages, you know, as populations get older, um, the ability to wage war, but also the desire to wage war s tends to decline. I'm not arguing that generals happen to be older than soldiers, but if you don't have soldiers, it kind of makes it hard to occupy the other country. Uh, otherwise, you kind of lose. So, uh, uh, no, I, I, I think that as the population ages, the way that, that way of solving problems is going to become less. 
In terms of uh, migration, the question was? Um, of climate change. Climate uh, change. Yeah, I looked at, and so I, I, this is something I spent a fair amount of time on, looking at refugee populations in the world today. There are none that the UN has actually claimed as, claimed as climate change refugees. There are none in the world right now. Uh, that doesn't mean that there won't be, but it's not a large source of refugee populations. The biggest source of refugee populations in the world today are basically those that are created by political instability and war. Uh, almost all of the refugees, if you just shut down a few difficulties in a few places in this, in, in this world, we'd have almost none. And that, that's obviously in places like South Sudan and, and other conflict states in Africa, and also what's going on in Syria and Afghanistan. That's where almost all of the world's refugees come from, and that's not being driven by climate change. Now, the Sahal is obviously a, an area of Africa where this could become a problem. There's places in the Middle East where this could become a problem. There's places in Asia that you know, could be underwater where it's becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. But today, uh, they're not really sources of refugees, or at least not declared as or defined as refugees. The, th the last one on the waste of food just shows you that there's another potential way that we could, by working a little bit smarter, help to deal with this population increase that's going to go up by another billion people. If we, you know 40% of our food supply is wasted, we should be able to take care of that relatively easy. So um, I hope that answered your questions. Thank you. Question over here? Yeah. Um, your uh, viewpoint is far more optimistic than mine's is. I'm far more of a pessimist, but um, in- Well, you can leave then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, do, I do agree with the idea that the population would decrease, but do you believe that it could even decrease at a faster rate due to, as I already mentioned, uh, the excesses of climate change or political instability, uh, the conflicts and, and the violence will further decline the already declining population or uh, birth rate? So um, Population Matters has taken on the book. Uh, they're an NGO that mm -hmm. looks at population issues. They accept the UN numbers. They do not accept our numbers. Um, and uh, I would say they would agree with you in two different ways. First of all, they would just say we're wrong, and the UN uh, numbers oh, And by wrong. the way, they said that without reading the book, which was, uh, I thought it was an um, you know, perspective. <laughs> but then they would also argue that even if we are right, it doesn't matter. Uh, we are desperately overburdening the earth at seven billion people. And um, whether we stay at seven or whether we move to nine uh, doesn't really matter. We should be far below the level of seven that they're at right now. Again, we say uh, on the first issue, well, you know, read the book. We think our arguments are fairly compelling. On the second issue, um, that's n that, that, um, that may be true. It may be that at, at seven billion, we are already straining the resources of the planet beyond uh, their carrying capacity. All we can say is that up until now, the, great, the, the, the narrative arc is we are able to handle it. Right? So again, when it was around 3 billion and Paul Ehrlich was writing, when it was 4 billion and the Club of Rome was writing, um, you know, when it was it, uh, 6 and 7 billion and the current uh, guys are, are writing, they're all saying now we're at the point where uh, it's tipping, um, and let's put, let's put it this way. Here's why I'm an optimist. I was raised a Baptist, and in, in my church, um, we were always at the end times, um, and you, you, could, you, could, you could see for sure that the, the, that the revelation foretold the creation of the European common market, and that Israel, that meant that the temple veil was going to get rent, and, and all of these things were proof positive that the Antichrist was among us and the end times were near. And I remember at about the age of 12, being, um, going through going the archives, and there was the Gravenhurst banner from sort of 1895, an evangelist saying, end times are near, we pr the British Empire is proof that the Antichrist is coming, and so on. And I suddenly realized, oh, wait a minute, these guys just want doom, right? Um, all we're saying in the book is that we handled it at one billion, we handled it at, f at five billion, we are handling it at, at, at seven billion, at least in terms of our ability to sustain um, ourselves uh, you know, and, and, and our lifestyles. Will the pace of climate change outweigh the speed of innovation? Um, that is going to be ultimately be the way in which climate change is combated. So batteries that will sustain uh, large amounts of energy um, and vehicles that will uh, be fully automated um, and the like. 
I don't know. All I know is that up until now, the narrative has been we work it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm an optimist, um, uh, despite being raised a Baptist, because I think evidence shows that we, we work it out. Yeah, and I'll just add one more thing to that. If we're wrong, where we're not wrong is probably on the question of fertility. Where we're probably wrong is on the question of longevity. So for example, if we find a cure for cancer, or we find a cure for heart disease, all our estimates about the size of the population are going to change. Uh, because that would affect the number of people who are going to stay on the, in the, on the face of the planet. But the, uh, uh, the truth is, the, the other part of it, the addition of, of more people as a result of births, uh, I think we're pretty right on that one. A long day for some people in this room, and I think it's time to uh, say thank you. Um, before we wrap up, um, just uh, a few points. So first, as someone who did economic forecasting at the Bank of Canada, I realized at one point what you do is you build a really good, you, you decide your numbers and you build a really good story around them. <laughs> and um, you might be completely wrong, but you've got a great story and you, and, um, and you just see where things go. And I think that's exactly what we heard tonight. They've, they've, got, a, they've got some story, they've got some numbers, they've got a great story. And, um, and uh, I urge you to read the book and, and read the story. The book's for sale outside and uh, it's also available on Wordworth's books. And, uh, and it's, it, is, it's, uh, it is really fascinating to read. Um, two things that are coming up here at CG uh, next Monday. Uh, we'll be hosting a panel of experts in international law and they'll look at uh, the implication of technological changes uh, facing the international legal order and the impact it'll be have on trade, peace, security, human rights, the environment, everything. It's a, it's a real mouthful but I can assure you it's going to be really interesting. It'll start at 5.30 and it'll be followed by a reception. Uh, on April 30th, um, there'll be a film in the cinema series that'll be, that's called Netizens, and it delves into the lives of three women whose lives have been transformed via online harassment. And following the event, there'll be a panel of local experts discussing the issues raised in the film and the intersections of safety and technology, gender, consent, and law. So uh, on behalf of CG, I'd like to thank our John and uh, and Daryl, like, as I say, the book is uh, well worth reading and uh, could not have been written by an economist. Uh, it's just got uh, too many interesting story, uh, stories in it to, to bolster uh, their argument. Um, so thank you very much. Vesma, thank you. And good night, everyone.